Ok. Okay, I'd like to welcome you this evening to the Hudson Library and Historical Society Zoom cooking program with Nash. I am Jody Delamater, and since I am socially distanced. I am going to remove my mask because I'm choking here. But think of all the money we're saving on lipstick and chapstick. Uh, we're going to keep you all uh, muted because that improves the, the sound quality for everybody. So uh, if you could do that, but I know you have questions because we always do. So what we'll have you do is uh, go to the bottom of your screen and you should see an icon that says chat. And if you click on that on the right hand side of your screen, there'll be a, a place for you to type your questions. And I will be monitoring those questions and I'll get them up to Chef Rick. Maybe at the end we'll be able to have a free for all, but really the sound really breaks up a lot when we don't have everybody muted. So please try to keep yourself muted. Um, I don't know about you, but last night I went shopping for a few ingredients. And I don't know if you've had your watermelon tequila, but I have, and I feel like I really am in Hawaii right now. Excuse me. It's very good. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and put that down in the chat. And I do want to tell you that uh, we do have some more spots yet for That's next, for next week. MELT program, MELT 4.0, which is a week from tonight. And that's going to be a, a little bit special of an evening. We've got a raffle planned and a couple of announcements. So uh, if you're inclined to enjoy Matt Fish of Melt, which we always have in the past. I invite you to that program. We also have a lot of other programs. We've con we hit the ground running when we, uh, when we closed with the pandemic, we all had a, a little bit of a break, but then we really did hit the ground running and we have been offering lots of virtual programming from our regular music programs to the author programs ukuleles uh, coming back again uh, on Tuesday, there's a lesson. So there's just gobs and gobs of things to do virtually. And speaking of special nights and special programming, I do want to welcome back Chef Rick Carson of NASH. Uh, he's been here before, he's been to Hudson before with our cooking program and he was scheduled for, I believe, April. Of course, that canceled, and he jumped at the chance to do this program virtually. So I am very excited and very pleased. He has great creativity, great enthusiasm, and Nash has great food. So uh, go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon that says reaction and give them a hearty hand of applause. Virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chef, go ahead. Well, Jody, well, thank you so much for the intro. Um, I'm here tonight at, uh, this is our storefront. This is uh, Nosh Catering. Um, we've been here for, gosh, almost going on a decade now. And I've been cooking in Hudson, cooking, farming in Hudson, going, um, cooking for about 15, 15 years now, um, with Nosh being uh, uh, the majority of it at almost 10 years. Um, unfortunately, uh, we, we weren't able to farm as much as we wanted to um, this year. 
but it's a good thing we have a lot of friends. We have a lot of friends and uh, they've definitely been big supporters tonight. Um, we, we brought in uh, tonight, uh, we asked, uh, we talked to Melanie Brunty uh, from the Farmer's Rail. And I hope you guys are excited because they're actually going to be opening up in Hudson. I can't wait, I can't wait. Um, right now they're on North Cleveland Mass Road in Akron and uh, they just have great products. Um, they grow all their own product. Everything is fed uh, certified non-GMO. Um, and the butchery there too, it, it's just, it's something very special and unique. And that's why we partner up with them and utilize a lot of their products. Um, tonight we're, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to show you um, a couple different uh, techniques and ways of, of grilling tonight. And I also uh, have some different recipes um, from Chef Derek, from Chef David and myself. Um, and, and they're all the chefs over here at Nash. This is a chef driven catering company. Um, speaking of friends, we also, this is my very first time. I'm not sure if at home, um, what you grill with, but this is my first time using a Traeger. So tonight we're gonna see how the Traeger does. Um, our friends over at Ace and Hudson, uh, I told them I was doing a cooking demo and I didn't want to you know, cook on our big giant grill smoker that we brought, that we had made in Tennessee. And uh, cause no one has it at home, but I'm thinking that a lot of people do have a grill at home. This is a, this is a smoker actually. It's very cool. Um, it's fed with pellets. Um, there is cherry maple and uh, cherry maple and what do we got tonight? And oak, obviously. But uh, yeah, we're gonna put this guy on the test. So, but before we start things off tonight, um, before we start things off tonight, we are going to uh, also make a cocktail. So a lot of things lined up. Um, we're gonna get things going. So maybe we start start off with a drink first. What do you guys think? Thumbs up. Okay, perfect. So right now um, we have watermelon in season. And besides uh, all the different culinary techniques, culinary techniques, uh, salads, appetizers, what else can we do? You know, you can pickle watermelon rinds. Um, that's, that's been very popular in the, in the past uh, uh, five years or so. Um, we've definitely been doing that. But I figured that uh, we're about six months away from Christmas. So why not do a Christmas in July cocktail? And Christmas in July cocktail, uh, what's red, what's green uh, to make it that color? Not really the flavors of cinnamon. Um, so I decided to go with uh, some watermelon tonight. We have watermelon, we have fresh watermelon, and we're gonna add some tequila. And the flavors that we're gonna impart in there is a little bit of basil and something that's not on your recipe. Uh, so for those who are watching tonight, you're gonna get this tip, is a little bit of ginger. Now, what I have in, in the recipe calls to make a simple syrup. Now within that simple syrup, I want you to also take about maybe an ounce of ginger and slice that up and put that into your simple syrup. So you have your simple syrup, once it's cooked down, simple syrup is just um, equal parts of sugar and water that you bring up to a boil. And I actually like, like to let it simmer about another minute or so, uh, let it get a golden color, reduce some of that water and concentrate the sugar flavor. And then we pour it on top of uh, basil um, and now you also have ginger in there too. And that's what's really going to bring all the flavors together in this drink. And once you do that and everything cools down, what you're gonna wanna do is strain it. So I am straining. So we can get all the impurities out of there. So now I have this beautiful golden simple syrup, which has flavors of basil and ginger already in there. So now let's make the cocktail. All right, so fresh ice. Another tip, if you can, buy some ice molds that create larger ice cubes, especially in the summertime, because this is gonna dilute the drink. Um, and having the thicker ice cubes um, will definitely give you the chill factor you want without watering down all of your flavors. So next time we'll do that. But for today, we'll just use the ice from our, our ice machine. 
All right, so we'll start off. What's the mic? And I wanted to make this as simple as possible, but uh, with great flavors. And I'm really not particularly a fan of watermelon or watermelon drinks, but this, this came out uh, pretty well. So I took my seedless watermelon, uh, cut it in half, cut it into sections, and I took out the inside. I always reserve these. I can carve them into something neat or pickle them like we were talking about. And you're gonna to wanna to take your watermelon and put it into a, a food processor and really just uh, pulsate that down. And then you're also going to strain that. And then I strained it and made uh, watermelon juice out of it. So um, this is just watermelon. And then what I'm going to do tonight, your recipe calls for adding soda or seltzer in there. Now, what I've found lately is that um, at home, rather than you know buying cans of soda or, or, or bottles of uh, soda water, um, I, I bought what's called a soda stream, or you can use an SSI, so that I'm actually not uh, creating so much waste. So now I've got my watermelon juice in here, a little bit of water already, and this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool stuff. This is watermelon with just a little bit of, uh, of water. Um, I'll say this is about 80% just watermelon juice. And the rest is water. And the reason I put water in there is if you just use straight watermelon juice, it's gonna foam up on you. And if you don't have this machine, you can just, just use the watermelon itself that you uh, pureed and then just use the, the can of soda. That's, that's uh, exactly. And, and uh, just use uh, a can of soda water, just like the recipe says. But I thought this would be neat to show because I'm a big fan of uh, you know, sustainability and, and trying not to be so wasteful. So right now I've got the ice and you see how it's starting to melt already. So we need to make this trick quickly. <laughs> So we have our tequila that we're putting in here. That's about an ounce of tequila. And you know, it's been a hard day. Put on another splash. And now we've got our simple syrup. And it depends on how sweet you want this to be because the watermelon already has sweetness to it. So I'm just gonna put just a little bit. That's probably actually only about a teaspoon. I know this is a large spoon but I barely put any of that in there. There's our watermelon. And then you can also garnish it with some fresh picked basil. And I also love lemon verbena too. And what you wanna do is just, just, just a quick tap. Quick tap, release those oils in there. And give a little bit of a stir around. And this should not be overwhelmingly fizzy. This should just have that light fizz to it. And a tequila, the watermelon, the basil, the ginger, the verbena, they all come together well. So I don't even like watermelon drinks. This is actually pretty good. The sun's coming out, the perfect drink for it's grilling. Pretty My it's pretty good means really good. Excellent drink, Rick. I've got one right here. It's very good. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, on to uh, on to grilling and cooking. Actually, do we have any questions about the, the watermelon drink before I move on? I don't see any in the chat room yet. Okay. All right. Perfect. So tonight we'll start off with uh, um, I guess our protein that's going to take the longest. Now this is Chef David's. Uh, Chef David's country style brined and smoked bone in pork chop. Now, what we have here is pork that we got from Brunty and we're going to brine it. Now with brining, brining recipe, this very basic classic brining recipe is 50-50 sugar and salt. 
water, aromatics, and we add a little bit of vinegar in there. So tonight we're going to take one quart of water. We're going to take a quarter cup of salt, quarter cup of sugar, And remind you, um, if you're doing this for a gallon, it'll be one cup of salt, one cup of sugar. Easy breezy. And uh, what I'm doing now with a one quart of water, uh, a quarter cup of salt, a quarter cup of sugar, this will be enough to brine, I'll say at least six, six to eight thick cut pork chops. Um, I'll get this watermelon out of here. Now on to our, our aromatics. Okay, so I have thyme. And this is actually lemon thyme that we grow at the farm. And once again, just, just a light tap on here. Um, I've got some rosemary. Or you can also just tear it. But you definitely want those oils to be released. That's super important. Release those oils, get them in there. Got some garlic, you can either use uh, already chopped up garlic or you can use whole garlic though, just get a little bit of a smash on there. Two garlic cloves, and that was uh, a couple sprigs of thyme, one sprig of rosemary. We got the garlic cloves in there. And after you do this for the first time, you can always adjust. That's the fun part about this. This is, this is a basic recipe um, that, that turns out well every time. Um, now we're going to put a little bit of lemon peel and why lemon peel once again it's about the oils lemon peel really has a lot of oils and you want to stay away from cutting too much of that pith off because uh, that's going to add bitterness so try to keep it clean keep it clean keep it clean and we're also going to add a little bit of this juice in here too so now we have the water, the salt, the sugar, aromatics. Um, we have garlic. Let's throw a little bit of uh, shallots in there. I'm a big fan of using garlic and shallots. Want to eat a little bit of shallots. This is probably maybe one sixth of a large shallot. Um, after everything's said and done, this is probably one tablespoon packed of chopped up shallots. Yeah, definitely. They can't hear me, so you have to say something that I asked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so someone just asked me if, if I would uh, show you a technique of, of julienning, and that's called uh, brunoise on the shallots. Let me wash my hands real quickly. It's getting really hot out here, really hot out here. Um, so I'm going to take that bad part. So, this is how I do. A, this is how I do a brunoise. A brunoise is a, a classical French term for a, a, a julienne and a dice. Um, What's a julienne is another French term. Julienne is uh, a way for chefs to let other chefs know how they want something cut. Julienne is a thin slice, a thin slice that's about the size of the back of your knife. Okay, and technically, you want to be technical. It's uh, two and a half inches by an eighth of an inch, but that's okay. So you don't cut it to the end? I don't cut to the end so I can have something to hold on to. And pull the way. And then I go through and basically I want to go just as thin, that eighth of an inch cut. And always keep your knuckles out there. And, and, and my knife is, is is resting. So you want your knife resting. And this is what's called your guide hand. And you're kind of feeding it into a machine. And if this is the first time, if this is the first time that you're that you're learning knife skills or, or working on knife skills, I also recommend, you might think this is strange, I also recommend actually placing your hip onto the stainless steel so that you're not moving around. Now, it, if you're centered, this keeps you locked in one place. 
you have your knuckles out, you're holding on to the onion, and you just race through it. Another thing about shallots, onions, fresh herbs. You'll see a lot of people just come in here and chop it through, chop it through. Now, if you want these shallots to stay beautiful um, for three days, four days, five days, one cut, one clean cut, doing this chop, chop, chop is called bruising. And then within you know, 24 to 48 hours, it's, it's gonna start releasing a lot of uh, the fluids in here. and It's gonna start turning green on you, okay? But, uh, and you know, we're gonna put it in here. We're gonna throw some extra shallots in there. We're gonna do that tonight. Okay, so we got the shallots, we got the garlic, uh, we have the citrus in there, um, the aromatics, um, salt, sugar, vinegar. Let's do a couple uh, tablespoons of vinegar. That's uh, two tablespoons of vinegar, one quart of water. And this beautiful pork chop, and we're just gonna let it sit in here. And this is enough to brine six of these. You just need a, a larger container. And our recommendation is to brine it for at least 24 hours. Now, if you don't have the time to brine it for 24 hours, what you're going to need to do is, is up your salt and sugar mixture, not your water, just the salt and sugar amounts, uh, at, least, at least double it. And then you can cut that time to three hours. That'll be fine. So, We'll let this go ahead and marinate, and 24 hours later, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Jeff, does it matter what kind of vinegar you use? Uh, it, it's all about preference. For me, I'm, I'm using uh, Banyol's vinegar. Um, you can also use sherry vinegar. I like something that uh, depends on what I'm going for, but for like um, an overall, overall general flavor, um, go with like, and apple cider vinegar, sherry vinegar works well, spaniels works well because it has a little bit of sweetness. It's not, the, the acidity is a little bit lower because um, we have a city with a citrus um, and it won't impart um, such a strong flavor. So once again, uh, spaniels vinegar is my, my go-to choice for, for this recipe. And does it matter what cut of the pork it you use? Um, does it matter what, no, no, it, it will not uh, matter on the cut of the pork, but what, what we're doing is, is we're doing um, a smoke and a grill. So we also wanna eat this medium rare, or medium rare, medium, I would say medium, just because of the quality of the meat, um, medium rare to medium. Um, so you definitely want to go with a, the pork loin, uh, pork loin chop, you don't wanna go with something too tough or else you're, you're gonna to have to cook it a lot longer. Um, yeah, great. And we'll take a look at that. We'll pretend, you know, here in about 15 minutes, that's been 24 hours. And uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna show you exactly how it comes out. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna clean up this mess and we're gonna move on to our chicken. Any more questions about the pork? Yes, one more. How long do you brine it? These are great so, questions. So my recommendation is to brine it for 24 hours. But if you don't have the time to brine it for 24 hours, um, and you can do it in a half a day or, or uh, you know, you only have four hours to do it. Just make sure that you double the amount of salt and sugar in there. You don't need to double the, the water, just the salt and sugar. But once again, 24 hours is, is perfect for this. You could probably actually get away with 12 hours. So. All right. So now that was uh, Chef David's, um, his, his uh, smoked country style bone-in pork chop. And now we're moving on to uh, Chef Derek's um, marinade that he has for our chicken thighs. And what the, the, the most important thing about everything that we're doing today too, or not, not the most, um, what, one of the most important things that, that I wanna make sure that everyone really pays attention to is, is the quality of ingredients that you use. Uh, use fresh ingredients. Um, the, the freshest, uh, fresh ingredients are better. Um, if you don't have access um, to going out to the store, you know, once again, I'm sure that there's someone in your community that, that you can talk with. You know, we, we partnered up with a lot of people today said, hey, can you help out with this? We can help out with that. So 
um, and also having that relationship with your local community, your farmers, knowing what they do is, is extremely important. Um, so we have beautiful bone-in chicken thighs and I'm a big fan of chicken thighs. Chicken breasts are great, but they tend to dry out a little bit. Um, the, the chicken thighs have a little bit more of fat that runs into them. Um, it is dark meat. It's, it's going to stay a little bit more moist. And Chef Derek has this uh, Peruvian style marinade on there, which is out of this world, out of this world. And basically, uh, Peruvian style is, has uh, um, Peru's in, in South America. So it has uh, Latin flavors, Spanish flavors, and also Asian flavors. They're all, all kind of blended in together. And today we're, we're gonna go on the milder side and not really too many, uh, use too many chilies. So we'll start off with a little bit of uh, tamari. Uh, and we only use tamari here at Nash. Uh, tamari is gluten-free soy sauce. So we've got some tamari. We've got a little bit of fresh garlic. A little bit of fresh shouts. And it says scallions on your on uh, the recipe or the description. But if you have chives, which they're in abundance right now, um, go ahead and use chives too. Make it your own, make it your own. Key ingredients are the tamari um, and the paprika. And this is a Spanish paprika. And this is smoked paprika. Because we want that in-depth flavor. And this is plenty of marinade for probably about, uh, I'll say four, four or five of these chicken breasts. And last but not least, the one thing that we're missing in here is a little bit of acidity. I'm a big fan of acidity. Um, so it provides balance, um, also helps to bring out the natural flavors and things like salt. And the acidity that we wanna use, we wanna use lime, lime in this recipe. So we use lemon in the last recipe. Uh, with this chicken, we're going to use lime. All right, what else? You guys tell me what else I'm missing? What else am I missing? What does a chef always put on everything? Salt, a little bit of salt will be good to go. And you know, you're probably asking, well, you already put the tamari on there, but the salt itself is gonna help to open up the pores. Um, it's gonna help to open up the chicken to actually pull in the flavors. It's gonna pull out some of the moisture that's already in the chicken and bring in these flavors back into it, where soy sauce won't do that. All right, fantastic. And, and I recommend, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of making sure you have time to, to marinate this. Um, I would say let it marinate for at least an hour. Um, for those who really want the full flavor, I would say six hours. But if you don't have that much time, if you can at least give it about uh, 30 minutes, I wouldn't be mad at you. Okay. All right, let's see how this thing works, huh? So this is a pretty neat system here. Um, this is a Traeger grill, it's my first time working with it. Uh, this is actually a smoker um, that has a little fire pot underneath and it's fed pellets. It's, it's all, it's all, pellet fed. And once again, this is the, the hickory, the cherry, the maple, and this thing can get up to 500 degrees. So and we'll see how that works. Now, do you prefer sea salt or kosher salt? I, I always prefer sea salt. Um, it, it just depends on what you have available. You know? I guess um, wrong. 
And uh, <laughs> but isn't all salt sea salt? Yeah, I'm I think sure. you're right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, and as far as kosher salt, sea salt, you know, is sea salt a lot more beneficial for you? Nope, nope. Um, but you can get different grains and textures and flavors from sea salts compared to kosher salt. Um, as far as I know, there is not any um, anything that's beneficial um, with sea salt compared to kosher salt, um, except for certain varietals of sea salt. But I digress. Let's get back to uh, the proteins. So now this is this is my recipe. This is a recipe that I came up with uh, probably at the beginning of the year. Um, this is for an event that uh, is coming up uh, this summer. And uh, I wanted to use black garlic. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with black garlic or not. Um, this right here is, is black garlic. Look how beautiful that is. Black garlic, you know, it's, it's not fermented. It's not smoked. It's not burnt or roasted. It's not cooked. This is aged, aged garlic cloves. And it actually starts to create um, what's called, um, boy, I'm definitely gonna mess this up, uh, the mallard reaction. It's not a duck. Um, it's, it's actually the same reaction as when you're caramelizing something. So it starts, you start to get all these beautiful sugars that come out of it. Because believe it or not, um, garlic has a lot of sweetness to it. And as this starts to age, you start to lose the moisture. Um, and then you start um, getting, getting the sweetness out of it. And with that aging, uh, the caramelization, I mean, you get this beautiful earthy, very umami kind of uh, aroma that's, that's coming out of it. It's, it's, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I've got uh, my black garlic paste and, and you can either buy the cloves like this and smash them down yourself or, or you can get the paste that, that's already done. You know, keep it easy breezy. Um, but if you wanna experiment, um, go ahead and, and buy the cloves so you can do a lot of different things with it. But I have a little bit of uh, the black garlic in here. And now I'm going to, in your recipe, um, I think I gave that the ingredients tonight and it calls for lemon juice. Um, but the way that I wrote this recipe calls for yuzu. Yuzu is uh, a Japanese citrus. And a, a quick shortcut to yuzu is that I've found that that works well enough. It's, it's not the real deal, but works well enough as equal parts of uh, lemon and orange juice. So we're gonna put the yuzu in here or the mock yuzu, we shall call it because it's not the real thing. We have our black garlic. And I want, I want a little bit more sweetness. So rather than using sugar, um, let's use some, some maple syrup. We got maple syrup. Some salt on the meat. I like to put a little bit of espalite pepper, red pepper. And if you don't have espalite uh, Spanish red pepper, call that a pinch. You can just take uh, crushed red pepper and, and grind it up finely. And once again, we're also going to need a little bit of uh, tamari in, in this recipe. So I did use all my tamari. <laughs> Thanks, you chef. Okay, so for right now, um, I have my sous chef grabbing some tamari for us. We have this flank steak that we're gonna marinate. And I'm just massaging the meat, um, you know, really try to get in there. If you want to, you could also take a fork and, and kind of um, poke at it to, to really get in there especially if you don't have the time. No. Because once again, I like to let this marinate for, 
three, four hours. I've got just a little bit more acidity in here. All right, so Jeff, we have you, a little tomorrow. Do you have suggestions uh, where you can get the black garlic and if you have allergic uh, reactions to oranges, is there a substitute you can recommend? Ooh, um, that, that's a first for me as far as the oranges go. Um, that sounds like a doctor question. Okay, uh, if, if you're allergic to oranges, to me, I would assume that you may be allergic to a lot of citrus, but it might be a reaction to, to medication. Um, in that case, just go ahead and use, use lemons. Um, if you can find yuzu at your, your local Asian market, use uh, the yuzu. Um, and then as far as the black garlic, you can order that online. And I'm not sure, uh, I haven't meant to, to Heather's heat and flavor, but, but she may have some there. That is in Hudson. All right, so we have this marinade. How about we check on our chicken? I completely forgot about it. We're still doing great. Because with this Traeger, I set the temperature and I've got an internal clock. So I know it's at 500 degrees. That's, that's, a, that's the nice thing so far that's that uh, I'm noticing about it is that I don't have to worry about, you know, adjusting the flames and it's super insulated too. So it's holding all the heat in. So that's pretty cool. One star so far. I've got the chicken moved over. Now we're going to put our flank steak in here. All right, so we're going to let that go. Now, as we're, as we're letting that cook, um, it's time to start prepping up the rest of the meal. So I'm thinking that we start uh, working with our mushrooms that we forged. That's good. That drink is still good, by the way. So big fan of fresh products. Um, I go foraging um, here in Hudson. Uh, we do farming right down the road. Uh, Ken and Joyce Carrilla, they have a company called KGK uh, Landscaping Design. And we've been working on their land for seven years now. And probably year two, um, I started wondering, you know, do mushrooms, are, are there mushrooms that grow in those woods over there? Um, looked for morels, really didn't find uh, hardly any morels. We found some wild asparagus, which is pretty awesome. And, and then my very first year looking for chanterelles, um, we found uh, 60 pounds of chanterelle mushrooms, 60 pounds growing right here in our backyard in Hudson, Ohio. And they're fantastic. So this is, these are called golden chanterelle mushrooms. Can't tell you exactly where I found them because you know, can't give away all my secrets. But uh, golden chanterelle mushrooms, um, this is definitely a coveted mushroom. And I was very surprised to know that they grew in Ohio, that, that they grew all over North America. But these mushrooms have, uh, when they're fresh, they actually smell like um, watermelon rind. But as you cook them down, they're gonna have uh, like a, a toasted almond kind of flavor to them. So this really goes well with just about anything you can think of. And tonight we're going to pair it with uh, the flank steak. So I've got chanterelles, and then I was lucky enough when, when I was foraging the other day that I found some uh, wild oyster mushrooms too. So these were growing on uh, a piece of uh, oak that had fallen down a couple of years back. Um, There's a whole bunch of them growing off the side. So it's pretty cool that uh, right here in our backyard, we have oyster mushrooms, we have beautiful chanterelle mushrooms. So I'm going to clean off my board and I'll show you how to clean mushrooms. You guys have any questions right now? I don't see anything so far. Oh, someone okay. did All mention right. that Heinen's often has black garlic in stock. Oh, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Is that um, an Asian food that maybe Asian markets would have or? Uh, yes. Because um, okay. we have a lot you on know, I go shopping. Yeah, I go shopping um, 
to a lot of Asian markets, um, ethnic markets in the area because I love trying to find new spices. Um, so far, I have not seen any uh, black garlic, but uh, that's pretty awesome that Heinz has it. So right down the road from here. So we have our chanterelle mushrooms. And if, if you've never gone mushroom hunting before foraging, um, please don't go out and just start picking mushrooms and thinking that you're fine. Uh, you really need to go out with someone who knows what they're doing because there are a lot of mushrooms out there that will kill you. Um, we actually have uh, known chefs that have gone out foraging uh, that really, you know, they've only gone out a couple of times and uh, they, they picked the wrong mushroom, which looks similar um, and they've gotten very sick. But I'm going on over 10 years of foraging now. And uh, luckily enough, chanterelles are, are one of those mushrooms that uh, you really can't mistake. Um, what they do have is called a false gill on these mushrooms. So it, it, it looks like it, it has a gill, but, but there really isn't a gill. It's, it's, it's a false gill on here. But once again, make sure you go with someone who has experience before you go foraging for chanterelles. So after you pick your chanterelles, you've had a great day. You know, you've been drinking uh, watermelon cocktails, you've been out foraging, and uh, you're ready to start cooking. What you want to do is, is uh, soak your chanterelles. So you've got all this dirt on the bottom. At this point, you want to take these off. Take your bottoms off. Compost them, throw them back out in the woods. Maybe you'll get some chanterelles growing in your backyard. And once you cut the bottoms off, soak them in water. You don't need to put salt in the water or anything like that, just regular clean water. And let them soak um, five, five to 10 minutes is completely fine. And what I like to do is with running water, then I like to pull my mushrooms apart so that if there's loose, if there's any more dirt, it's just gonna wash off. And after we, we pull them apart, we'll then let them in a sense dry out again. And it's very important to dry out your mushrooms a little bit before you start to saute it. Because the whole point of sauteing these mushrooms is, is to get that sear on there, to sear your mushrooms, um, develop the flavor by pulling the water out and concentrating the flavor of the mushroom. So it shouldn't be boiling in a bunch of water. It should not be boiling in a bunch of water. So these are starting to look a lot cleaner. This is fantastic. And if they're still dirty, you can uh, put them into a strainer, give them a good rinse, and then let them dry out. All right, perfect. Chef, can you substitute black garlic for whenever you use garlic cloves, say in making pickles? In, in making pickles? Um, boy, if just as long as you're not using the garlic, um, if you don't need the raw garlic or garlic flavor, because your black garlic is going to have a completely different flavor profile. And it's not going to have the live enzymes as uh, fresh garlic does either. But uh, that would definitely make a good pickle in my opinion. And let's do a quick uh, spot check on our protein. Okay. All right, this is looking pretty great. All right, put this guy back down. So it seems like it has a, has pretty good um, ambient uh, heat. So everything's cooking evenly. I'm not getting big scorch marks or big flames coming out. Um, I do like that. So two stars, two stars right now. So far, so good. All right, now I've got my oysters and I've got my chanterelles. And we're gonna saute these guys.
got a little portable uh, stove top right here. And what I'm going to use is just a little bit of uh, what's called rapeseed oil, canola oil. Uh, this is made from uh, what's called rapeseed, not grapeseed, but rapeseed. Rapeseed is actually in the mustard family. Um, and the reason that we use this is because it, it has the least amount of uh, imparting of flavors. So it's very neutral. It has a very high smoke point too. As far as the recipe with all the ingredients, with every single ingredient for the beef, um, you do not have that. Um, but if everyone really wants all the recipes for all the different marinades, I can definitely get that put together and sent out. I did send the ingredient listing for the beef and the ingredient listing and, and recipe for the watermelon cocktail. So I have, it, I have it start out on high heat and I'm going to add salt right away. And since I only have large flakes sea salt, this time Jody, I'm going to use the kosher salt. So a, a, finer, a, a finer salt on here. Because once again, I want the water to come out of the mushroom. Very important to get that water out so we actually taste the flavor of the mushroom. Now that I have it on high heat, I'm gonna turn it down low. Actually, we can go about low to a medium on this one. But all we're doing, we're not trying to get any certain colors or anything. We're just trying to reduce the water from the mushrooms and get more of that natural concentrated mushroom flavor. Does anyone have any questions about mushrooms? What's the gills? Uh, the gills, the gills of a mushroom, I'll show you on, on here. So, so, so these are called the gills right here, like fish gills. These actually hold the spores of most of your mushrooms. Like uh, if you have a, a portobello cap, portobello cap has a whole bunch of gills. And those hold your spores. And that's where you can do spore prints to check the species of the mushroom. And actually, uh, a little tip for everyone is if um, I love mushrooms and I love portobello mushrooms too. And if you get uh, the large portobello caps, grab a spoon and actually you can spoon out the gills because the, the gills, uh, they hold a little bit of the dirt, a lot of spores, and, and that's going to impart just a little bit of a bitter flavor into what you're eating. But if, uh, if you don't mind it, you know, then don't worry about it. Cook what makes you happy. And I just hope I can impart some uh, different techniques and flavors for everyone tonight. Okay, so you see how the mushrooms are in the pan and, and the pan's not boiling with water. That's what you're looking for. That's the key. Though. So we're, we're uh, all the water's evaporating. Um, or the flavors are concentrating. And I'll say this will be ready probably in about five minutes. So we'll just let that keep going. And I'm gonna set this off to the side. Perfect. So it's been 24 hours and we have taken our pork chop that we brined. Um, you don't need to rinse off the brine whatsoever. Just, just, just take it out of the brine, pat it dry. And what I've done is I've taken a cast iron pan, I've put it into the, um, the smoker or, or grill. Um, and if you don't have a smoker or grill that you're using, you can also do this in your oven too. And I threw it into, this, this cast iron pan. And we have this beautiful car coloring that's on there. And this was actually smoked earlier um, because the whole, the whole point of this, to brine it um, and then to smoke it. 
This is our, our country style smoked pork. So that's looking pretty great. Our chicken, looking pretty good, pretty good. Okay, still nice and moist. We have a chicken thighs and we have an even temperature grill. Just the, the only thing I would want right now, this is working out great. The only thing I would want is a little bit of a higher heat to really get those grill marks on my flank steak. But so far, so far so good. I'll say we're probably about maybe uh, three minutes away from plating. All right, so we're gonna switch boards. And now you're just gonna watch me cook really fast and do a lot of plating, okay? Now that I'm to, to this stage of the mushrooms where they're looking pretty dry, I'm going to add just a little touch of butter in here. A little touch of butter. A little bit of onions that I've already caramelized. Leave it off the heat, good to go. Perfect. Okay. Now we're going to start sauteing our corn, just a quick saute in the same pan. And one thing I wanted to ask for those who are watching right now, um, how does everyone cook their corn? Do you guys start off in cold water? Do you start off in hot water? Do you add salt to it? Anyone? Oil, microwave. Okay. Cold. Soak in sugar water, hot water, salt, or grill it. Grill. I salt love grilled gold. corn. If, if I am, for, for this recipe, um, we have boiled the corn. Now, the way that I have seen it cooked from you know, when I was a child to the way that, that I teach my staff how to do it now is that we, it's a rule for us to always start in cold water just like if you're cooking potatoes, start in cold water. Because if you, if you drop this in the hot water, what you're doing is you're cooking from the outside in and you want to start in with cold water. Cold water, you're, you're cooking a lot more evenly and, and don't worry about adding salt to your water. Typically, I will put salt in most of our blanching pots and when I'm cooking potatoes um, to, to help season what I'm boiling. But with corn, with corn and with beans, I, I personally suggest that you don't put salt in that water just because of the fact that it's going to make your kernels um, a little bit tough. And it does the same thing with fresh beans as well. So we've got some corn and, and I don't know if you can believe this or not, this is actually Ohio corn coming from down south in uh, Columbiana. So we've got this corn I'm taking right off the cob. That's cool too, because you can actually save your cobs and you can always uh, use the, the water for stock. And you can do a process too with, with cobs and it's called milking the corn. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's just concentrated like corn flavored stuff that can make a fantastic sauce. But tonight we're just gonna saute this corn with uh, just a little bit of garlic. We have the chantal mushrooms already. I've got some asparagus. A little bit of olive oil, salt, 
and I'm gonna throw it on the grill. We'll see how the asparagus cooks in the Traeger. Right now it's looking like our chicken is done. And a good uh, temperature for cooking chicken is 165. Country style pork. I like to cook that to about 145 and let it rest. Let your meat rest for 15 minutes. I've got the corn, chanfell mushrooms back in there. Off to the side. Got Chicken. We've got plank steak. Corn's on the grill, or I'm sorry, the asparagus is on the grill. Chantrill mushrooms. Now let's put everything together. And once again, let your meat rest. Um, if you go to cut it right now, juices are gonna go flying everywhere. You definitely want it to rest. Um, let those juices come out of it. They'll pull right back up. And it's gonna continue cooking as it rests too. So while this rests, we can work on the pork chop. Uh, it's a beautiful coloring on this pork chop. So the brine, if, if you can see this right here, this line right here is from the smoke itself. And brining your pork chop um, not only um, is going to ensure the flavorness of it, it helps to keep it moist. That's one of the great things about brining meats. So this, this is the tenderloin of that pork chop. This is the loin part with the fat, and this just looks so beautiful. Oh man. Great temperature, we're at a medium right here. Sorry. Country style smoked pork. And here is our chicken. Super juicy. That chicken is super juicy and that's the best thing about using thighs. Stay super juicy. And uh, you know, we still got the bone in here. So just follow your bone, it's right here and slice with it, slice again. But typically I'll just serve these whole and let everyone just go to town on them. So we've got the chicken, we've got the pork. Now time for the beef. And I truly wish that uh, I would let this rest some more, but uh, I know that we're running out of time here and I wanna make sure that you guys see a composed plate. So about one more minute and uh, we'll have this put together. We'll see how this, uh, this grill did with uh, the asparagus. Couple more questions. Uh, how long did you smoke the chops before grilling them? And I don't think you did. Uh, did you? Do you suggest using a meat thermometer? If if uh, you yes, I would always suggest using a meat thermometer. Um, if you haven't been cooking in the business for a couple of decades like I have, um, please use a meat thermometer. And then as far as smoking. In, in this, uh, 
for this equipment today, for this grill, I smoked it for about two hours at 185 degrees. And that's the cool thing about this is, is that you can actually set this to your, your cooking temperature. Um, you can put your smoke level on there as well and just, just let it go. So this is definitely something that you can walk away from and that you don't have to sit there and constantly um, keep your eye on it. All right, so we've got the asparagus. We've got a little, a little bit of uh, caramelization on here. Um, I would like to see a little bit more charring, but uh, so far, I mean, it's, it's still pretty good. We've got flank steak. And the one thing about flank is that you want to slice this on a bias. You want to slice it thin, and you want to slice it onto a bias. Now, if I were to cut big chunks out here, just because of the way um, the meat is developed with these straight lines, you cut a big chunk, you're going to sit there and chew on it forever. But this, it just pulls apart so easily. And you cut it thin, and you cut against the grain. But you see how all this moisture is coming out of here? Um, I haven't let it rest long enough. But it still looks pretty darn good. And this, this is probably at uh, mid rare medium, but you can't tell because it hasn't had time to actually rest. Okay, we've got the asparagus. We've got our flank steak. A bit of our mushrooms and uh, corn. So right now, everything here is uh, locally sourced. Um, even asparagus, this is the last of asparagus, actually. We're lucky that we could even get this. Um, this is the end of the season. Chanterelles are five miles away from here. Oysters are five miles away. Um, Brunty Farms, uh, right down the road here in Akron on, uh, I believe, North Cleveland Madison Road. And uh, you can't get any fresher, any closer than that. I mean, that's what it's about. I hope you guys enjoyed everything today. And that's um, exquisite. I'll... Well, thank you, thank you, Jody. And uh, please enjoy uh, enjoy cooking. Um, that's what it's all about. You really enjoy cooking. Have fun with it. Uh, experiment. Ask questions. You know, and uh, get to know who your farmers are. It, it's great to support local. Always support local. Um, and, and uh, you know, support your, your local farmers, but um, build that conversation, ask them how they're growing, ask them what they're doing, um, you know, make sure that uh, they're accountable for, for what they say that they're doing, so. I would also add support your local restaurants and yes. how do we get to Nosh? Uh, are you curbside picking up still? Are you eating outside, all of the above? Are we inside, so, outside? So here at, at Nosh Catering, uh, currently we are catering and then we have developed our stay healthy dinner menu, uh, which is every Thursday. It's, it's a meal kit, uh, meal planning uh, for your entire week. Uh, we ask that you order by Saturday and we'll have everything uh, for you to be picked up or can be delivered on Thursdays. So order Saturday for Thursday for the entire weekend. This actually is going to be on our next dinner menu. And with that, we also uh, bring in um, other artisanal vendors, um, local artists when it comes to the culinary scene or uh, small business owners. Like uh, we have Ball of Glass and they're actually going, they're actually pairing Floating Rock, um, Free Rocks Red wine with, with this dish. Uh, this is uh, CSM. And uh, so every Thursday we have our Thursday dinner menu. Um, and you know that's how you can support us and make sure that you support all the other local restaurants around here too. So stay healthy and uh, stay happy. Thank you so much, Chef. You've got lots of awesome presentation. Thank you, Yummy. Wish we could be there. Uh, everybody's enjoying it. Very well done. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. Everybody stay safe. I guess I don't have to tell you to drive carefully, but drive carefully anyways, even if it's not tonight.
And don't forget, we still have seats for next week. Nice job, Fantastic. chef. Oh, now what are you pouring? And don't forget, uh, this is the wine that uh, Lauren from Ball the Glass uh, had, had okay. paired with this dinner. Um, it's about 16 bucks a bottle. So you can actually get this ordered. So place your orders by Saturday if you can. Um, if not, we'll, we'll see you next week. And uh, hmm. That's a good idea. Have, have fun cooking in the kitchen. <laughs>